Okay, it is 2.15, so we are going to get started today. Thank you all for joining us. The session is Developing Diverse and Inclusive Gaming Collections. I am Burdock. I will be your moderator. Uh, it's a couple of reminders. The session is being recorded. Um, if you have questions as we go along, please do put them in the chat. We'll have time at the end to work with questions. And I'll turn it over to our presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you and hello everybody. Thanks for joining us today to talk about developing diverse and inclusive gaming collections. My name is Kristen Lampkowski. I am the Technology and Digital Strategies Assistant at Atkins Library at UNC Charlotte. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm joined today by two of my library colleagues, Beth Caruso, our Digital Pedagogies and Emerging Technologies Librarian, and Tiffany Davis, our Digital Scholarship Librarian and Diversity Resident, um, as well as two of our campus uh, our campus partners on this project, uh, Julio Bahaman, Teaching Assistant Professor and Associate Chair for Academics in the Department of Computer Science, and Heather Freeman, Professor of Art Digital Media in the College of Arts and Architecture. At the bottom of this first slide, you'll see a bit.ly link. Um, that link will take you to our slides from today, uh, and we'll show that again at the end so that anyone who would like access to them will have these slides. Before we start, we want to take a moment for a land acknowledgement. While we meet today in a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land that we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and, in, and to improve our own understanding of local indigenous people and their cultures. The University of North Carolina Charlotte is located on the traditional territories of the Catawba, Waxhaw, Shiraw, watery and sugary peoples. And as many of us are settlers, migrants and descendants of those forcibly brought to this land, we are here because this land is colonized. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Catawba, Shiraw, sugary, watery and Waxhaw peoples communities, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. Thank you for being with us today. We hope you'll accept this invitation to honor, protect and sustain this land and all of Turtle Island through shared knowledge and support for the many indigenous communities who continue to thrive in our individual locations today. All right, hi everybody. Uh, I am Beth Caruso, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and start with a quick introduction to basically our circumstances and this project. So first, um, Area 49, um, which Kristen, Tiffany, and I are a part of, is the library's collection of innovation spaces. Um, and two spaces in particular support gaming and game design, and these are the Gaming Lab and the Visualization Lab. Um, so Area 49's Gaming Lab was developed in collaboration with the College of Computing and Informatics, thanks Julio, um, to support the undergraduate certificate in game design. Um, but luckily it evolved into a place where all students come to invest themselves in gaming, um, whether they're new or they're assessing a game for later development or for class or whatever. Um, we have a um, we have an Alienware gaming PC, an Xbox 360, an Xbox One, a PlayStation 4 Pro, an Atari, and then we also provide games, controllers, headsets, and classic consoles for checkout um, from our technology support desk. Um, we also have the visualization lab, which supports um, VR. Um, we have a VR headset there, and then also game design. We have uh, various development programs. And then we also have um, VR headset checkouts through the tech desk as well. Um, but aside from just providing the spaces and technology, um, Area 49 also collaborates with instructors to develop workshops and activities that align with their course goals and help students to think about topics in new ways. Um, so we felt that this project was just kind of a natural extension of all of that. So kind of beefing up the spaces and, and helping classes too. Um, and so uh, as we kind of continue to grow, we recognize that we have a responsibility to um, praise diversity and inc uh, promote inclusivity in our offerings. So in the tech that we have and the spaces. Um, so now we come to this project. And uh, so the five of us, um, so Kristen, Tiffany, and I from the library, and then Heather from College of Arts and Architecture and Julio from College of Computing and Informatics. Um, we were able to get funding for this project 
through the Chancellor's Diversity Challenge Fund, which is a yearly opportunity for funding. Um, and it's designed to, quote, uh, support faculty, staff, and student initiatives promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in the intellectual life of the campus. Um, so we wanted to meet these objectives using the gaming lab as a catalyst. And so we figured that we would design, we figured that we would follow the plan that we have in this list on this slide. So first, um, we researched and purchased uh, accessible control and games that featured diverse characters, gameplay, development teams, and accessibility options. Um, then next, we had a panel of six industry professionals uh, to talk about diversity and inclusion in video games development and gaming communities. Then after that panel presentation, which I have to say was amazing, I loved it a lot, uh, we made games and controllers available to play test, but then at the same time, we released our survey to gauge students' opinions on the game's application to diversity inclusion. Um, the last step would be to use the survey results, which we're working on now, um, to determine which titles would make it into uh, Area 49's new diversity in gaming collection. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and jump into uh, discussing some of these aspects. Um, and first with about how we went about choosing what we would purchase. Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany Davis and I use the she, her pronouns. And a part of us choosing our titles and controllers, um, we were able to research uh, some of these um, accessible controllers and games and we wanted to put those into our collection. Um, I wanted to highlight a few examples of what we were able to include in our collection. Um, we chose the Xbox adaptive controllers. Um, these controllers are designed primarily to meet the needs of gamers with limited mobility, and they also include large uh, programmable uh, buttons as well. Uh, we also chose the Logitech uh, Adaptive Gaming Kits, and these kits um, contain buttons and triggers um, that are designed for gamers uh, with accessibility needs. And we also chose the, one of the game, well, a couple of games that we chose were Blindscape and Gears 5. Um, Blindscape is a game uh, that has no visuals, only sound. And Gears 5 is a game that has accessibility features that include uh, a, full mo a full controller remapping, a single stick movement, adaptive controller support, and narrated UI and menus. Hi, and I'm Heather Freeman. I also go by she, her. Um, we chose the games based on the diversity of representations presented in the gameplay, also by the design team. Um, and we were looking at games that did, or represented diverse uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds, gender and sexuality, social class and status, and also were addressing mental health issues. Um, we had a mix of independent and AAA games. Um, and one of the things that we noticed is that a number of the games actually crossed into multiple categories. So for instance, um, Papo y Yo, uh, was created by Minority Media, which is a Canadian independent game company. Um, uh, and it depicts a story of a boy who grows up in a favela in Brazil um, and is about uh, uh, alcohol addiction and his father. Um, it addresses issues of child abuse um, and also uh, economic disparities. Um, so it's, it's, uh, we found that a number of games did sort of cross over into multiple categories. And uh, some of the challenges, so there were uh, some challenges uh, narrowing down uh, the games and controllers. Uh, we started our research by creating a spreadsheet of suggested titles um, by our group members. And I know you're asking, how did everyone find their suggestions? Uh, were these just games that you played or liked? Or did you have a source uh, that you looked up for the games? Um, so we actually um, were able to check some national ORs um, like ablegamers.org um, for accessible controllers, uh, GLSEN um, for LGBTQ plus um, games. And also finally, we gathered suggestions from our student workers. Um, there were some controller availability issues that we came upon. Um, some of the controllers were sold out, um, assuming more than likely due to pa the pandemic, um, a lot more people were getting into playing video games, um, doing a lot more things uh, for leisure. Um, so unfortunately, um, a lot of the controllers were sold out, but we were fortunate to find um, an alternative joystick um, that we actually use um, to put in this collection as well. 
Um, some other examples of issues that we face, um, we could only use websites that were part of UNC Charlotte's central purchasing sites. Um, so anything that we wanted to purchase, it had to be on those purchasing sites in order for us to um, get those items. Um, there was also a special accessibility controller that was ordered through our collection, um, but it never arrived. So we had to dispute the order. And this was definitely a barrier that, um, that could approach for students that were in need of that particular um, controller to accommodate them. Another challenge that we all faced last year was COVID-19 changing our plans for how we would approach things. Uh, we originally intended to hold an in-person play session, um, likely in conjunction with the panel uh, conversation that we were going to have. Uh, we wanted to have students, faculty, community members be able to come in, play the games, uh, try out the controllers, and then give us feedback um, either in person that day or via um, an online survey. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't hold in-person events due to COVID-19, so we had to go all virtual with that. And the way that we adapted was to allow a longer checkout period for our items. Uh, normally the items that we check out for um, gaming are for use in our gaming lab in the library and they're on a three hour checkout period. We extended that to a seven day checkout so that people would be able to take the items home, um, play the games fully as much as they'd like, try out the controllers and then provide us feedback. When people checked out the controllers and games, we gave them the information for that survey, as well as a link to a LibGuide that we created to give them some information about the um, collection. We also, um, that leads us into how we decided to share information about the collection. Um, we intended to put it on our website. That was our first thought. Um, so this is what our website looks like. We normally break things out by the system on which the games or controllers might work. Um, and underneath each object, it tells you how long that they're um, available for checkout. So we listed it there for the seven day checkouts. And then we added information that it was a candidate for this diversity in gaming collection. But we wanted to be able to group the items in different ways and uh, share a little bit more information. So that's why we created a LibGuide. And in the LibGuide, we were able to break out the different representations that were within the collection, um, as well as provide some other information about why uh, diversity in gaming is important. Um, we originally had a link on here to our survey and the video from our panel will be up on here in the near future um, once we get past a little um, posting glitches that we've been dealing with. Um, but we want this to be a source for people not only to get information about this collection, but information about why diversity and inclusion in gaming is important. And we hope that we'll continue to build out the information that's available here, and even in the future potentially have games created by our students on campus that we could highlight here as well. All right, so once we made those games available after the um, uh, the the panel presentation, um, we sent out a survey to give to allow students to give their opinions on the games. So ultimately, those ratings and comments would help us determine if a game should actually make it into the diversity and gaming collection um, instead of just being a candidate for it. Um, but it would also help us figure out the various tags that we could use or the categories that the game could fit into. Um, so this slide right here, uh, I know it's a lot of text, but um, our survey was a lot of text too. Um, this is just a quick glance at the content of the questions, and I'm not going to go over everything here, but there are a few questions that we included that we felt were important to understand the game's application to diversity and inclusion. So we asked about representation of minorities and underrepresentation, un underrepresented populations um, in general, but because we also asked them to address any of the problematic components about um, their portrayal in the games, we felt that it was important to include the demographic questions at the end, because without these, we wouldn't really have the information we needed to interpret their comments. So for example, if someone who didn't belong to the group um, that was portrayed in the game said that the game wasn't problematic, but a person who did belong said that it was, um, that would probably be something for us to investigate. Um, and we might wanna reconsider including it in the collection. 
Um, in addition to some of the other questions kind of in the same vein, um, like the ones about restrictive visuals and uh, how the game made them feel, we also asked them directly about the collection and namely if they felt their identity was represented and if there were other identities they felt were missing or re were not represented fully. So again, the demographics questions would help us to understand their thoughts in suggesting these. Um, next slide, please. So we'll talk more about discoveries later, but I would just want to address two quickly, um, specifically about the circumstances of the survey. So first, we had intended for the play test to be an in-person event, like Kristen mentioned, um, but since we had to happen, it, it, since it had to happen mostly remotely, it changed. So um, we likely would have gotten more survey responses if we were to have the in-person event because people would be able to uh, complete it uh, then um, because the uh, survey was a little too long for an online survey with no incentives. Um, and it may it may have made more sense if they play, then rate a game, then play, then rate a game, instead of trying to rate them all in one sitting at home, because um, that made it a little bit lengthy. So uh, now I'll hand it off to talk more about the survey and responses. Hi, everyone. I'm Julio Bamon. I use uh, he, him pronouns. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about our preliminary analysis of the data. So we're still looking through the data. Uh, we had a total of 46 responses. Unfortunately, out of the 46, uh, 35 participants did not complete the entire survey. So from what we gathered, they started, they started answering a few questions and then simply stopped and submitted, not giving us gameplay data or they just quit altogether. Um, however, we did have 11 participants who went through the entire survey and out of these six actually looked at multiple games. We actually had a participant that played nine games and gave us ratings on, on all the, the nine games, which was very useful. And um, as was mentioned earlier by one of my colleagues, uh, we were hoping to have more participants on site, but due to the environment that we're in, um, some part there's only one participant who actually came to the games lab and played the games there that they rated. So. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So the, um, the key instrument that we used was a Likert scale, essentially asking participants to, to rate a game on a given set of prompts, that, the ones that were shown before, uh, from either poor to excellent. So for example, uh, representation of underrepresented groups and minorities. Is that poor or excellent? And then that would have been complemented by free form comments. So we could get uh, more nuanced data about their experience. Uh, next slide, please. A um, couple of things that we noticed were the, um, there was a, a variety of platforms being used, but if you look at the, the numbers that we have, the uh, consoles are, are being used quite heavily. So we have 30% of the participants using PS4s, 10% using Xbox Ones, and that's followed by Steam. So, so a pretty good split between Steam games and consoles with consoles coming out um, slightly ahead. Um, there were some games that were pure PC games and also some mobile games, which was very interesting to see. Uh, the games that we have here are the games that were played the most. So we just did, um, this is in no particular order, it's just a, a ranking of what games do we get the most responses on as people indicating they play the game. So with Celeste coming out ahead and, and Assassin's Creed, which was very interesting due to its portrayal of Native Americans. And then we have other games that, that came on from smaller studios as well, like Undertale and uh, Dream Daddy and, and others. Uh, next slide, please. So the, um, one of the key questions that we were trying to, to study was regarding the positive representation of minorities or underrepresented populations. Again, this is preliminary data, but what we found was that the highest rated games with the games with the most positive ratings at the top uh, of this list um, were uh, games like Celeste, uh, Dream Daddy, Undertale, Apex Legends, Star of the Valley, and Assassin's Creed. So it's interesting to, to see that the um, production value is important, but it's not the factor, the defining factor. So, so we have games from studios that are smaller than the one that created Assassin's Creed still being rated very highly. So that gives us um, some, some confidence that the data really focused on, on the actual content of the game, not, not the, the wow factor, how well the game, how um, you know, 
SNASI the game was and so on. Um, also, it's important to see that of all the games that we included here, they had at least um, a rating of neutral or higher. So, so we took out the, the outliers. And then, um, oh, should I mention this before? The data we're talking about is only based on, on fully completed surveys. We basically, if it was partial data, we're not using it here because that basically meant we didn't have gameplay information. And also uh, for a game to be on the list, it would have to have at least two ratings by two different participants. Okay, um, next uh, slide, please. The uh, next question that we were focusing on was the ease of use and accessibility. So things like, can the participants customize how the game is played? Can, can the game, game cooperate with the use of accessibility um, methods and accessible controllers? And um, we start seeing a, a little bit of a theme here. That some of the games that were rated highly in other categories start appearing here. So we noticed that, we also noticed that there are other games that they sort of move around the ratings or that they, this is the first time that they show up as, as something that was highly rated. Um, interestingly enough, of the games that were rated, we didn't have one that was rated poor. So no single game got a poor rating, which was interesting to see. And although the ratings were distributed across the scale. And again, uh, we only picked games for this list that had at least two ratings. Uh, to give you an idea, we had a list of something like 25 plus games. So we did have quite a few games, which ended up being one of the reasons why the survey was so long, which um, is something that we're looking to address, but more on that later. Um, uh, next slide, please. Another thing that we wanted to, to look at was, did the participants consider the game a fun experience? Because, you know, after all, it is still a game. It's still expected to deliver entertainment. So. Very interesting enough, and, and also sort of game validation to what we're trying to do is we see that a lot of the games that were highly rated, they also are rated as being games that people really enjoy playing. And we saw this in the comments. So, so things like Celeste, um, Assassin's Creed, Dream Daddy, they, they were highly rated in other factors, but also as being a good, um, a, a well-designed game, one that delivered a fun interactive experience, which is, which is really important because, you know, if you want, people to play your game, it needs to be a good game in the end. Also, it is really good to see that a game can be a great game, but it still delivers in terms of inclusion, diversity, and accessibility. So, so it gives us a lot of hope that, that we that there is some opportunity to go in the right direction. Um, also, um, I want to point out that we didn't have any game that was rated really fair. So ratings were all across the scale. Uh, there were some, not on this list, of course, that had a, a lower rating, uh, but the, um, in essence, they were, it looked like they were either strong opinions about the games being good or the games not meeting the mark. And again, the games that we show here, how it leads to ratings. And we see that games like Gears 5 show up, which very popular game, so that maybe explains it, but it's still on the list. Uh, next uh, slide, please. All right, so then um, what we did was we did a compilation of, in terms of if we were to consider the whole composite, inclusion um, and diversity, if we were to consider the accessibility and also the fun. What do these games do? Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm jumping ahead, jumping ahead. Um, graphics. Now, one thing that, that I was comes to mind is, um, you know, there are all kinds of schools of thought when it comes to graphics. Um, I think there's no denying that graphics can do a lot to create a, a very compelling game. However, um, the um, gameplay is also fundamental. So, so these things need to go hand in hand. But we do see again that games like Dream Daddy, Undertale, um, Life is Strange, Stardew Valley, that come from studios that maybe don't have quite the production power of studios like Ubisoft from X Assassin's Creed, they, they are still on the same list as being highly rated in terms of their graphics quality. Um, and that's important because, you know, somebody's going to, to spend money on a console to deliver high graphics power. They expect the game to look a certain way. They expect the console to, to be taxed, uh, to, you know, to, to, to shine. And, and we get to see that in here, that, that the game can be great in graphics. Was 
while also being a, again, that addresses the important questions. Interestingly enough, none of the games that we have on this list were rated poor. So I guess we could say that the graphics were at least decent. Um, but the games that are listed here, they, they have very good ratings. And again, at least two ratings per game. Uh, next, please. I oh, can go to, to the next. Okay, so here's the, uh, the combined ratings. This is where we looked at the, at the whole. How does the game rank in terms of fun, graphics, accessibility, and positive representation of minorities and, and underrepresented populations? With um, the caveat that we get more importance to the positive representation and accessibility aspects. So if a game didn't have a high rating in any of those areas, then it wouldn't be on this list. And interestingly enough, the, the thing continues. So we have games like Celeste, Dream Daddy, Stardew Valley, and Assassin's Creed. Um, I play Assassin's Creed 3 a lot. So I think I'm the one who might have suggested, let's put this on the list. And it's interesting to see that I, it, it, did, it did well in, in terms of how it was perceived. But I also really uh, thought it was great to see all these games from smaller studios, from, game, from games that are pushing the envelope. So, so again, the idea that you can still push the envelope, you can still um, work on something that is artful, something that really answers interesting societal questions without sacrificing gameplay, which is really crucial to a game that is, that is successful and, and playable. So next uh, slide, please. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Tiffany at this point. Thank you. So uh, at this time, I wanted to share a few of some positive quotes or comments um, that we got from people that played some of the games in our collection um, that we captured from the survey. Uh, from, let's see, Life is Strange, uh, the complete first season, um, one of the players stated that I never played a game in my life that involved being able to turn back time in a real life setting. It was truly impeccable. They also, one, another person stated from the same game uh, that there was uh, the option for subtitles and dialogue was read out. And I think they did a really good job with this. Uh, from Assassin's Creed 3, uh, we had a person state that this game directly addresses the historical treatment of Native Americans directly and gives the main character a lot of depth to express that side of the story, which is not often heard. Um, from Gears 5, uh, we have a comment that stated, uh, there are women and Black people cast as heroes. Uh, a woman is the protagonist and who, who you will play as. Uh, from Celeste, we have amazing and extremely challenging game, beautiful art, narrative, and language, and music. One of the best indie games I have played. It makes me feel tense, but I always feel as if everything is going to be all right in the end to take a deep breath. Uh, another quote is, maybe the hardest game I've ever beaten, uh, but in a fun way, one of my favorite games of any kind. And we also got a quote that stated, uh, Celeste is most, notably, most notable for its depiction of mental illness. So those are just a few of the um, comments that we received and you can see that they pretty much went into conjunction with what Julio was stating um, from the survey results. That's just me again. So from the um, quantitative and qualitative data that we were able to gather, although it was a small sample, uh, we thought it was encouraging. Uh, however, it is important to essentially retool and, and address uh, some of the issues that we noticed. Like we didn't have as many responses as we'd like. You know, it would have been great really great to have a lot more of those 35 respondents to really complete the whole survey. So um, things that are um, very, um, now that are a little bit more evident, but not necessarily easy to, to address is the, the length of the survey, because we did have quite a few games that we were considering for the collection. So we, we're going to have to get back to the drawing board and, and try to come up with a, with, with a way to provide an opportunity for participants to to play the games and rate them without maybe getting overwhelmed with the survey being so long. Um, 
one of the um, things that we are going to try to harness is um, as a university, we have courses that actually cover game design from the digital media perspective and from the computer science perspective. So we are thinking of making this an assignment for the students. So giving the students the chance to, to go play a game, you know, of course, we're mean, we're going to make them play a game and then take a survey about the game. And then they'll actually get course credit from it. And then um, also not limit, limiting it to our courses, but in addition, going to other courses, we have college to teach human computer interaction. So they could look into things like accessibility, for example. We have uh, people who study ethics. They can look at how uh, other cultures are being represented in the game. And then in essence, we're thinking of using the same assignment as potentially extra credit bonus points for their students. And then with that way, increase the, the sample. Um, as I mentioned before, we have 55 questions um, that understandably can be quite a bit. It's a, it's a large commitment. So we're going to look into, into ways to reducing that. And potentially uh, one of the ways we address it is since we have already identified some games that, that got really uh, interesting, we got really interesting feedback on, maybe we use a subset of the games list uh, for the both the study and the and the survey that we are going to continue. Okay. Okay, I think that's it for that part. Thank you. So uh, we also wanted to share some of our considerations going forward that Julio has started on. Um, so for our games and controllers, um, we want to create a collection within Alma, our LMS at the library, um, that will identify these items digitally and they'll be labeled on our website, as I mentioned before. Um, but we also want to identify the physical objects. Um, so we've created a sticker that's on the slide here um, that we will place onto each of the items that we end up putting in the collection. And that sticker links people back to the LibGuide via the URL on there and the um, QR code so that they can get more information about the games and why this collection collection exists. Um, we also have listed just some questions here of things that we are thinking about as we go forward, how we can grow the collection, um, how we can keep adding good games to it, how we can keep getting input, um, evolving this survey, but also uh, once the survey feels completed, how do we still continue to get input? Um, and then how do we market this and just make sure that people on our campus know that it's available? So these are the things that we're thinking about moving forward. And uh, another thing we're thinking about moving forward is, is the community engagement aspect. So we've mentioned this panel discussion a couple of times. Here you can see the slide of, of the speakers. Um, we had Latoya Peterson from Glow Up Games, Tara Mustafa. Uh, Eve Crevache actually wasn't able to make it. So Kelly Dunlop, uh, who works for uh, Take This as well, was her substitute. Mark Barley, Atia Newman, and Mark Reich. Um, and they all have different backgrounds and expertise and issues relating to diversity and representation within gameplay, game design. Um, it was a fantastic panel discussion. Um, and we went into it with the understanding that we all agreed that um, diversity and representation in games is important. We sort of braced ourselves for some trolling, which didn't happen. We had amazing audience questions. We were really, really pleased. Um, one of the things that we appreciated too is that we advertised this to um, the local public libraries, to local community college, uh, public schools, gaming clubs. And so we did have a pretty good audience beyond just UNC Charlotte. Um, the fact that it was online probably helped in that, that regard as well. Um, one of the things that we discovered is that um, the, the, cop, the conversation really hinged on um, industry practices and what needs to happen in the industry to improve uh, representation and diversity within the gameplay itself. And then also had that tied back into um, uh, player communities and that player communities can uh, shape that demand really. Um, one of the things that we weren't able to get into was uh, issues of how to break into the industry. So, you know, if you have a, a panel discussion on diversity in gaming, um, and then students are showing up and asking questions about how do I get into this industry? You can kind of assume that maybe they're from a more underrepresented group that would like to get involved in that industry. Um, uh, we weren't really able to field those questions within the context of this panel discussion. So this is something maybe we can think about going forward is having something similar for students who wanna get in um, and might have a hard time getting their foot in the door because of their educational background or, or whatever. Uh, 
All right. So um, aside from just continuing the project, I'm also really excited to uh, continue integrating these ideas into classes in a lot of different ways. Um, so one thing, um, one of our plans is to expand our, our LibGuide, um, which I did say that we, uh, I put that uh, in the chat that we do have a link to it at the very end of the presentation. So if you're interested in all those games and also if you're interested in uh, at some point the um, the panel presentation, um, it will be on there. Um, but we're hoping that our LibGuide is really going to include even more uh, resources, activities, game reviews, and just links out to various things, um, which of course we can't really do with just the library's general website and our one page for for our gaming checkouts, um, but we're also hoping hoping that uh, in doing that we'll have the opportunity to help students engage critically with the games and um, some of these different ideas in whatever ways they want. So I'm hoping that we're not going to just be able to bring these into the gaming classes, which I know we will, but also in other classes too, so that they can think about um, you know representation in various avenues and for various disciplines. Um, also, we have been really lucky that we were able to replace our main gaming PC in the um, in the gaming lab um, and that we can still keep our old one and that it still works. Um, so with the older one, we are looking to hopefully house student made games um, like the ones that Heather and Julio have their students make in their classes. Um, so I guess as an extension of this project, um, we're not just furthering the culture of gaming at UNC Charlotte by housing those games, but I'm hoping that in housing the games and also giving them the opportunity to list their games on the diversity and gaming collection that students uh, on the collections uh, list, I guess, um, that students will be more inclined to develop games that are more diverse and inclusive, um, because we're really privileging that outwardly. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that that will um, go according to plan there. Um, but I will let Heather talk about the last bullet on this page. Yeah, and um, so as as Julio mentioned earlier, he and I are horribly cruel and mean professors, and we require our students in our classes to play games as a homework assignment um, and evaluate them. Um, and so we plan on capitalizing on this collection really heavily in coming semesters uh, about two, well, actually this fall will be our third year collaboratively teaching these two classes together. So my art students create the graphics and his CCI students uh, create the programming level design um, and production. And uh, one of the things that we've talked about trying to figure out how to do is um, uh, build uh, assignments where we're using more the Games for Change model. So hopefully uh, a number of you are familiar with Games for Change is happening in New York, uh, well, online this year, um, next month. And uh, these are games that are created and designed around issues ranging from social justice to environmental education and all sorts of things in between. Um, and as Julio was mentioning earlier, the really critical factor is that games need to be fun to play in order to get the other ideas across. Um, and so by utilizing this gaming collection, our students can start to see, oh, this is how a game is fun and how the graphics are also good. And also, by the way, it has this really diverse representation or it's addressing mental health issues or, or whatever the topic is. Um, so uh, hopefully over time, we'll be able to uh, show students that uh, games that are, have diverse representation can be fun and are in fact are fun um, and can also be quite innovative and exciting. Um, and yes, I think that's it. And the final thing we wanted to touch on here was just thoughts for um, any of you who are thinking about doing this at your library and sort of the processes that we went through and the things to consider. Um, so of course, funding is always an issue. Um, and we were lucky enough to have the grant available on our campus to fund this project. Um, so we encourage you to look and see if your institution has something similar or if, some, uh, in, if there's another organization in your community that might have something similar. Also, feel free to reach out to donors and alumni um, who might be interested in helping fund this or donate things. Um, I'll say Heather here has donated some games to the library recently that we're going to be able to make available, maybe not specific to this collection, but um, reaching out to people never hurts. Um, and also consider free games. Um, on the LibGuide, you'll see a few games listed that are free um, for PC and mobile gaming. Um, and we're gonna continue to look for additional ones to add to that um, for people to be able to play at home if they don't have a console or um, they're not able to come into the library and play on a console.
Um, also the time considerations, um, as you saw, we went through a large process to select our games. It took us um, over a year for us to really do all of the work that we've talked about today. Um, and we're continuing um, to think about adding new games and uh, which games should be in the collection. Um, so it can be a time consuming thing, um, but hopefully um, something that you're willing to invest that time in. There's also the time for delivery and ordering of items. Tiffany mentioned the controller that didn't show up, the controllers that weren't available. So keep that in mind too, that some of these things are in high demand and you might not be able to get them right away. Um, and finally, um, just consider getting feedback and keeping your collection current. Um, so we wanna continue to get suggestions and input from people um, and think about how we can continue to expand this collection and make sure that it really is representing um, our gaming community and our community on campus. So we went a little bit longer than we had originally intended, but we'll try to answer a few questions here at the end. All of our contact information is available here with a link to the slides again. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us afterwards as well um, if you have questions that we don't get to today. So I'll address the uh, question from Angela. She says, uh, do you have faculty from areas like English, English literature or other subjects that approach the library to use games as part of their curriculum or is it mostly in game design and programming? Um, so our Area 49 spaces, we have a lot of different stuff. Um, so we have uh, the gaming lab, which is what we talked about mainly today. We have the visualization lab where we have VR. Um, we have the maker space where you can make things. Um, we have a lot of different spaces. And so um, I haven't really been contacted as much from people in other disciplines about using the gaming lab specifically, um, but there are a lot of classes that will come into the visualization lab and we'll do something with virtual reality. Um, and a lot of times we end up using, I mean, my favorite to use with that is Google Tilt Brush because you can just do so much with it and you can demonstrate a lot of concepts and students can kind of, um, you know, uh, do their own thing there. Um, but we also have, um, uh, we've had people from dance come in and think about how VR relates to dance. And there's some really interesting connections that people are making. So um, yeah, so it's not just from kind of game design and programming. It's we've, we've kind of uh, worked in a lot of different areas. Um, I don't think I'm really going to have enough time to talk about all of those things today, but if you're really interested in that, definitely email me. Um, my email's on the slide. So, um, and I guess I'll address the next one too. Um, so um, this question is who staffs those areas and how is it monitored? Um, so we have, um, uh, so in terms of um, managing the spaces, we have three of us who manage the spaces. Um, and uh, so library faculty and staff, but then um, there are student workers who staff the technology support desk. So that's where um, technology is checked out. And then there are also student workers who staff the maker space. Um, and there are some overlaps between them, but in terms of what we've talked about today, it's mostly going to be the tech desk. Um, and the tech desk lo actually looks over into the gaming lab and you can also see some of the other spaces as well. Um, so for the most part, it's student workers that are uh, staffing the spaces, checking out games to people, um, you know, showing people how to turn the TV on because it's a little weird, you know, going to channel three for the Atari because a lot of people don't know that you need to do that anymore. Um, and, um, you know, but then we'll help out if there's, um, you know, uh, any sort of uh, additional troubleshooting that they're not sure of or if there's this weird problem that they haven't encountered or something like that. So um, for actual staffing, it's student workers, but we, uh, we manage the spaces and then we also do teaching and consultations and um, you know purchasing for the spaces and stuff like that. I also wanted to jump in on the previous question about um, faculty from other areas. Um, uh, I think it was in January, our, our university put out a call basically for R1 proposals because we're in the process of transitioning from research two to research one. Um, which sort of sent us all in a kind of weird panic, but <laughs> but um, Julio and I worked together to develop one for uh, game design as a, as a sort of research area, but also deep undergraduate education area. And the, the regardless of what happens with the R1 proposal, 
Um, it's actually sort of helped us network with faculty across the university. We have our UNC Charlotte is huge. It has 30,000 students. Um, so uh, it helped us sort of get to know all these faculty who were doing research in games or interested in teaching in games, but uh, and a sort of as a sort of side side avenue to their main research. And so having a community of faculty who are interested in this as a topic area from from diverse perspectives um, will sort of help us sort of foster that community on an on an educational platform. So I actually um, met with a, a faculty member in writing and rhetorics just the other day who's interested in media and representation as, as visual rhetoric, as well as literary rhetoric. Um, and uh, she's, we were talking about this gaming collection and she's really excited about it, folding it into her classes in the fall. So I think um, as this collection, as the word of this gets out, I think there's gonna be a lot of faculty in different areas who will find lots of ways of making it relevant to their coursework. I know that we're at three o'clock, so uh, we don't want to hold people over. But again, thank you, everybody, for attending today. If you come up with other questions, again, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation, guys. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks.